eat like a kid. Like eat when you're hungry, stop eating when you're not. Like just, I really yeah. like hammered that into my head in my 20s to sort of get back to a healthier place. And I did. Welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein and I'm a registered dietitian based in New York City. Today's guest is Lisa Jung. She is based out of Boulder, Colorado, and is an outdoor sports journalist, editor, copywriter, author, and content marketing creator. We actually connected a couple years ago because she was interviewing me as the nutrition expert for her latest book, Running That Doesn't Suck, How to Love Running Even If You Think You Hate It. And Lisa certainly knows what she's talking about because she was not a lover of running for her entire life. So she shares that story on today's episode, as well as what life's like with her two young boys, and they're very active as a family, um, what they're up to in Colorado, uh, you know, her background as an adventure racer and kind of how she got into all the various sports that she does. Um, We talk about a lot of different things, actually, not all nutrition related, but we certainly cover nutrition as well. She's a gardener. She's a baker. I'm very, very jealous of her baking skills because I am not talented at cooking bread like she is or baking bread. Um, And and yeah, it was a really great chat. And I think you guys will like it. Um, So have a listen and let me know what you think. Without further ado, here is Lisa Jung. Lisa, thanks for coming on the show. It's great to have you on. Thank you for having me. So you are an outdoor sports journalist, among other things. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and the writing editing that you do? And yeah, just a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, I am a freelance writer and editor and author. I live in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I write about running and other outdoor endurance sports, including adventure sports. I moved to Colorado in 2002 to work for Trail Runner Magazine and then started Adventure Sports Magazine with a colleague and ran that from 2002 to 2005. And then when that, when the doors closed on that, I became a full-time freelancer, still writing about gear, running, adventure for different magazines like Runner's World and Outside, a men's journal, and Backpacker. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been in this space a long time. I became a blogger for Runner's World and I wrote this uh, Baby Steps blog while I was pregnant with my first son. Mm-hmm. Um, which was 12 years ago. And then I was the shoes and gear blogger for Runner's World and then managed a trail running microsite for Runner's World for a number of years um, and just have written about mostly running, but all sorts of outdoor sports uh, in the endurance world and adventure world for a long time. And I have two books out. The first one was called Trailhead, The Dirt on All Things Trail Running. And that was mm-hmm. that came out in 2015. And then my latest one is called Running That Doesn't Suck. How to Live Running, Even If You Think You Hate It, and that uh, came out this past summer. And that's how we connected, of course, because you connected. reached out to me. You know, it was yeah. funny. I was looking back at our Gmail email chain, and it was like 50 messages. I'm like, what on earth? And I was like, oh, yeah, that's like the original email that you reached out to me on um, from September 2018. And yeah. uh, we, of course, connected on that for the fueling chapter. So right. listeners who want to, especially my non-runner listeners, and they want to check out her book, which is fun and funny and awesome, um, you can find me quoted uh, in the fueling section. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was like so long ago and I totally dropped the ball on, you can, I got like emails like, oh, you hey, didn't. did you get my book? And I'm like, oh my God, I totally did. But you know, baby life and like, oh, just yeah, baby life, man. Consumed. Nice. I forget about everything, but, um, but sure. yeah, it's a great book. So everyone should check it out Thanks. and awesome. It, and, and when you say adventure sports, like what falls into that category? So adventure sports, as it related to the magazine we ran, um, it was based around adventure racing. Um, but we also covered Xterra, off-road triathlon, or anything adventurous and outdoors. Um, and now, I mean, adventure sports meaning like, I just, I have an essay in Backpacker this month about snowshoeing in Grand Teton National Park, or I'll write about uh, skate skiing or just outdoor adventure sports, I guess. Outdoor endurance sports that have an element of adventure mm-hmm. related. And do you do all those things? Do I you- do. No I do a stuff. lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell, tell um, me some of, the, some of the things you do other than running. Okay. So I used to be an adventure racer, but um, I used to also be a triathlete. And then I was a, uh, an off-road triathlete and that led to adventure racing. But before all that, I was like a volleyball player, ball sports athlete, soccer, volleyball. Um, 
And so now with my sports, I don't do adventure races anymore, like the multi-day, lots of suffering, foot travel, riding a bike, sometimes carrying your bike, paddling and all that stuff. Um, now that I have two boys, two kids, and try to get more work done than <laughs> running around in the woods, I do um, a lot of mountain running, um, skate skiing in the winter, snowboarding in the winter. Uh, I swim laps. Um, I do CrossFit now, like to sort of maintain a healthier body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Just running. I need to do the strength training to stay balanced. Um, but yeah, I still, I get out and do all sorts of stuff uh, for a lot shorter duration than I used to. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And, and you, of course, I mean, there's like a short section about you in the running that doesn't suck book. Um, and, and you mentioned that you grew up loving sports, but as you also describe, you weren't always the lover of running that you are now. So no, I hated can you, it. Yeah. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into running and how you okay. went from hating running to now loving running? Yeah. Because we all know people who are like, oh, I hate running. Yeah, and and uh, many of us friends. lovers of running, we've been there before. So yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? So I grew up in Southern California playing soccer and tennis and then eventually volleyball and was just this like Southern California beach kid. Um, and in high school, I did track, but I was purely a sprinter and a jumper. And then as I got later into high school, I didn't, I barely even did the sprinting and I was just a jumper. And then we'd have to do this two lap warm up for track practice. And I hated running so much that I'd hide behind the high jump mats, like those big foam pits. Mm -hmm during the two lap warm up and like pop out right at the last minute as if I dog two laps. Um, so <laughs> I avoided it at all costs. Yeah. And then in soccer, like I'd be coming off of volleyball season, going into soccer and just, we'd have to do some like runs as a team. And I was so out of shape because I'd just been jumping, like jumping and diving and jumping and diving and not running. So I just did not enjoy running distances of any sort. But um, when I was transitioning and going to college, I was wanting to walk onto the college volleyball team. I was going to UC Santa Barbara and I knew one of the requirements for that was to run a timed mile and we had to run a sub seven minute mile. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh God, I don't know about this. <laughs> so that <laughs> summer after graduating high school, I um, knew I had to start running, but I went down to the beach because I was, you know, I loved the beach and I started running there and I barely got to like a lifeguard tower without having to walk. And it was, it was a struggle, but I just kept going and I just kept going down to the beach. It didn't really occur to me to go anywhere else because I just knew I'd be happy at the beach, even if the running sucked. Um, yeah, I was going to say, that's kind of a hard place to start running, like in the sand. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it took me a while to realize that, okay, don't run in the deep sand, go down, you know, where the yeah. hard packed. And then once I did that, that maybe helped things click, but I just, kept going and it was pretty and when you're running on the hard pack sand it's actually like like a good rubber track honestly like it mm -hmm. if if the tide is right and it's relatively yeah. flat and it's you know not too wet not too soft um but it just not too clicked. slanted not too slanted exactly and I've uh, since learned if I'm going to run on the beach and I always did this anyway because I never wanted to run on the road is turn around and run this back the uh in the opposite direction so that if it is a little bit slanted at least you're yes. getting slanted on both sides of your body. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But it just, it worked out that summer that um, there was one day that the sun was setting and I was running and I just suddenly felt like, ah, you know, this actually feels pretty good. And it became sort of an addiction then. And then I went off to college and did that time mile and did great. Like actually it turned out that I was a better runner at the time mile than I was like a division one college volleyball player so <laughs> I just like I kept doing that time mile but never saw the volleyball court and then like learned how to juggle volleyballs on the sideline for a season and then quit because <laughs> I just yeah. wasn't playing and I never was going to and so when I quit I kept running and then I entered like the local 10ks and did okay there and then became like this club triathlete at UCSB and kept running and kept running and the running um stuck ever since you know and that was uh, a while ago <laughs> to say the least Amazing. it was a while ago <laughs> yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. just continued awesome. running yes awesome and by the way I feel like I've interviewed so many people who live in in Colorado not mm -hmm. Boulder but just like Colorado generally that people are going to start to think that this is like only people in who Colorado live in Colorado, Colorado. <laughs> is a Colorado that's funny podcast. 
it's just, just a coincidence. I promise yeah. people I'll be interviewed from <laughs> other places, but it is pretty funny. I mean, yeah. it is an amazing place to be active. When, wh- at what point did you move to Colorado? So I, um, it was 2002 and I'd lived all over California, not all over, but I grew up in San Diego, went to UC yeah. Santa Barbara and then lived in San Francisco for like my mid twenties nice. of living in the city and yeah. you know, those crazy fun years. But then I got burnt on, uh, on that and moved to Marin and then moved to Tahoe for a couple of years. And I kind of been popping all around and then um, just was looking for something different. And people had told me that I'd love Colorado and I got a job at trail runner and was like, Hey, I'm just yeah. going to go check that out for a year. But I don't know how many years, almost 18 years later, I'm still here. Wow. Yeah. I met my husband yeah. the first day, which has something to do with <laughs> still being here. like literally yeah, the first that, day. That does help. That's yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah. And now I live then. here, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. yeah. I go back to yeah. California yeah. a lot because I, I miss the ocean and I still love running yeah. on the beach. I still love playing beach volleyball and I still get in the water and, you know, surf little waves on a big surfboard when I can. So I, I travel out there a lot, but um, Colorado has been a nice place to raise a family and just to be super active and have access totally. to the mountains and the trails without so many people. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was born and raised in Santa Cruz, California. And, oh, okay. uh, and yeah, so so I'm I'm definitely a California person, California girl, and I've been on the East Coast for like a trillion years, but still mm-hmm. trying to get back to the West Coast oh, or are? somewhere with ocean. Yeah. yeah, you know, eventually my family's still out there, and yeah. um, you know, so in Santa Cruz is so unique because it has the mountains and the ocean, and yeah. and I and it's just such a great place to be active. I mean, not just Santa Cruz specifically, but the yeah, West but Coast. You're right. That is a nice combination because like where I grew up in San Diego it's mostly beach, you know, there are some yeah. dirt trails or like shrubbery, you know, but it's not like, it's not the mountain combination that you get in Northern California. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's tough when you grew up by the ocean, it's like in your blood, right? It's like part I of you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and it's I down was a, to uh, beach and it's tough. I know. You were what? I know. It was a, it was a five, I was like a five minute run or walk or whatever 10 minute walk to the ocean from my parents house and yeah. um so like when you were talking about your little beach run I was thinking uh-huh. I was, you know whenever I go home to visit the first thing I do like my first morning as I wake up I go early because I'm always on east coast time yeah. I go down the beach just hope the tides are in my favor because it gets right. like we don't have I feel like northern California or at least Santa Cruz you don't have that like huge beach that you get in, in southern California yeah and uh, and I go for my little you know, five mile run and it's so beautiful and, and it's just like a total reset, you know, yeah. on your just body and mind. And I miss that tremendously. And, and yeah. every time, cause my husband's like, we can go to Colorado. Uh, cause you know, we both love running trails and such. And, uh, and I'm like, but there's no ocean. Yeah. What am I going to do? And I'm like, it's like, there's no ocean in New York city. I'm like, yeah, I know. We don't really see any ocean. <laughs> you gotta move you gotta be by the ocean like that's how uh, I do it when we talk about like we hard. love Boulder but my husband will be like well you know we can go to Boise it's less expensive I'm like if I'm moving I'm moving to a beach like I'm not I'm content where I am but if we're gonna pick up and go I'm gonna be closer to the water so I yeah hate uh, uh, anywho so yeah. this is a <laughs> show about nutrition so let's we're gonna move on to nutrition now I know I always get so sidetracked talking about other things but um but yeah, let's talk about your nutrition growing up. Okay. So you had a Korean dad, um, an Irish Catholic mom. Um, yep. I imagine there were some influences there. Um, yep. Tell me a little bit about the food scene in your house. So my dad would eat kimchi with every meal, including like spaghetti. <laughs> He'd have like a side of kimchi. And I just remember our kitchen smelling so like funny. kimchi. Um, but my mom um, was very healthy. Like she just, I think she was pretty progressive back then because that was like, you know, the seventies, eighties, yeah. um, she was, she was very health conscious. And so we had a lot of vegetables in the house and she wasn't cooking fatty foods. Um, but we had a challenging house because my dad didn't eat any poultry. My sister wouldn't eat any, it was something eggs or red meat and I wouldn't eat any fish. <laughs> so okay. it was, uh, it was challenging, but, um, my dad, we had bulgogi, you know, like a Korean barbecue uh-huh. beef. Um, yeah, yeah. So we had some influences like that. I don't remember any like foods from my mom's upbringing necessarily, but she she cooked pretty healthy meals, I would say. Um, but I just had a palate like I was fairly picky eater. Like I was very like texturally picky. Like didn't want mm-hmm. anything that was kind of gross. But um, have always really enjoyed fruits and vegetables and um, mm-hmm. yeah. 
So did your dad cook I, like, or just my mom? dad cooked? My dad would like ha- do the bulgogi, you know, he'd like marinate the thinly sliced beef and Asian. And then he did cook some, he's uh, a big fan of like ramen noodles. And so uh, mm. we had that and he called it sloop because it was like soup <laughs> slurp. <laughs> so like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now my boys call that kind of soup sloop. Um, so he uh-huh. cooked a little, but it was mostly my mom cooking. And my dad was also um, a pilot. So he'd travel for chunks of days at a time. And then it would just be my sister and my mom and me. And so we'd have simpler meals when he was gone. So she, she did a lot of the cooking. She did most of the cooking and say, did he make his own kimchi too or no? Um, no, he did not make his own kimchi. He'd go to like the Asian market and stock up and stuff like that. And we had some other things like dried squid in a bag. We always had in our house, like real salty. Like my friends would come over and be like, what is that? And we wouldn't tell them. And then we'd <laughs> they'd try it, like it. We're like, it's squid, you know? And they'd be like, oh my yeah, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so we had some like Asian market foods in our house. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, it's kind of nice. I hadn't really thought about that in a while. So it's kind of nice to remember those things. Did um did you like those things like the dried uh, squid in a bag? That sounds so weird, by the way. I know. I mean, I I did. I mean, it's kind of jerky, like you know, like yeah. it's just salty, sure. like it, unrecognizable meat. Like it's just like just this dried salty <laughs> stuff, and I didn't mind it. I didn't like reach for it to snack on or anything. But um, sure. we had to, we didn't have a lot of desserts in the house, like sugary cereals of course if my mom ever went out of town my dad would buy the sugary cereals it was like that kind of thing but um yeah we were pretty healthy growing up I don't yeah I mean I think I had a fairly healthy relationship with food Mm -hmm. yeah did you have grandparents around or any other family like around you or was it just your Um, mom and dad it was just my mom and dad and me and my sister my grandparents my grandfathers both passed away before I was born and my grandmothers passed away when I was fairly young I had a um, Korean grandmother until I was about eight and then some relatives up in LA so not too far away um like my aunt uncle cooked like my aunt cooked tremendous Korean meals so I kind of remember that too Mm. yeah are your parents still living east coast um my mom actually passed away a couple months ago oh I'm so sorry thank you so I'm processing that and then my dad um is still living and he's still in southern california but he's been um not well for a number of years also so it's been a oh, okay rough chunk of years being sort of in the middle having two young kids and then two yeah aliens. part of why yeah. i go back to california so often honestly like i go out yeah. like once um uh-huh. so yeah yeah that's, that's where yeah we're at. it's it's this time in your life where um I mean, i'm slightly younger than you i think but but it's like especially living so far from family. I think that's another reason why I think about California is, you know, my parents are in their mid late seventies and, um, you know, my, my one grandparent that's left is my grandma who I'm really close to lives in Texas. She's 91 and her health is also failing. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't all live close together anymore. And it's, it's very, that's a very tricky thing to navigate. And especially when you have young kids. Yeah. 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 Um, anyways, um, so let's go back to the nutrition stuff in your history. Yeah. So you were, of course, very sporty, very active. Um, I'm not sure that you were thinking about food as fuel much in your teenage years, but perhaps in college, if you were trying to be, you know, this volleyball player, you're running more. I mean, tell me a little bit about how you v- viewed food, you know, through your teenage and, you know, early 20s, all those years. It definitely changed when I got to college. Um, I became aware maybe in a negative way <laughs> um, okay. of what food. Like, so one of my college volleyball teammates took a nutrition class and started telling me all this stuff. Like I just suddenly became aware of what was fattening and what wasn't. And then what was, mm-hmm. she told me some stuff about meat and I totally freaked out about it. And then like, I remember the last red meat I'd had, I had, and this is still to this day, the last red meat I had was a double double from in and out on the way back from the ski trip and then I was like I'm done I'm out <laughs> and from that point wow. on I became mostly vegetarian and in college huh. yeah and it was um you know in college I lived with a bunch of girls we were in Santa Barbara and like we we're all yeah. had been had been high school athletes who were struggling in college sports to be anything off the sideline you know so then mm. one of my roommates you know, just it's there's a lot of unhealthy eating going on, put it that way. Yes. And like I struggled for those years, even despite, you know, becoming a 
triathlete. I just was not fueling. I was not eating for endurance. I just, it just, I was way too aware of what was fattening. I worked at a frozen yogurt shop and ate like frozen yogurt because it was fat free, but I was like pounding oh, sugar at the time, you know? <laughs> like just sugar, like sprinkles, yeah. like eating the cones or just whatever. It was terrible. Um, and restricting, like I eat a pot of rice with broccoli and call it dinner, like a, like a half a cup of rice, you know, in this little pot. Yeah. Yeah. Make that yeah. boil the broccoli on top, or like steam the broccoli on top, and then I'd ride my bike with my pot to the beach and eat dinner watching the sunset. But it was like a pot of half a cup of rice. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you know, it was pleasant, but it wasn't um, fueling for what I was doing yes. at all. Yes, yes. Yeah. And it's hard when you were when we're mm-hmm. all very misinformed. I mean, it sounds like that was kind of mm-hmm. coming off of that whole age of you know, fat is bad, all fat yep. is bad, and that whole yep. thing, which we now know not to be true. And yes. and I mean, it's tough when you're surrounded by other women who are feeding you that kind of information, yeah. influencing yeah. you in that way, and not to be susceptible. Yeah. So I, yeah, um, it's, it's yeah. an interesting time looking back on it because I think we were all sort of then getting competitive with each other about it all. You yeah. know, it's like yeah. it's not good. And then there was one summer between my junior and senior year of, no I don't remember but I was like a short order cook at a snack bar but I wouldn't eat any of it and I remember eating like a coconut popsicle and then like halfway through the popsicle I read the wrapper and I'm like oh my god it has five grams of fat and I threw it away like that's <laughs> terrible like it's terrible but that's just where uh, I was back then you know yeah but it took yeah. a number of years after that to like I remember forcing like eat like a kid eat like a kid like eat when you're hungry stop eating when you're not like just I really yeah. like hammered that into my head in my 20s to sort of get back to a healthier place and I did so and what kind of motivated that like you I mean you got out of that college environment but I'm well two two questions first first the question is actually backing up for a second sure you were doing trash you're doing triathlon like yeah. how did you get through your workouts if you were I mean it sounds like you were under under eating sure. essentially yeah. like were you I underweight mean, like what was going on there no I was not underweight because of all the frozen yogurt I was eating like oh I yeah that's right of sugar. course like, actually so you probably were okay <laughs> yeah I was fine but and they were short distance I was just doing Olympic distance stuff so nothing okay. was too long um and I got by you know who knows yeah. how it would have gone had I actually fueled properly but like in college I never once ate a pizza like I never ate a pizza, you know, like we just, I just didn't do it because it was fattening. I'd get burritos. We had this great burrito shop and that was like a treat getting a free birds burrito, but it was like a vegetarian burrito. Um, I mean, I did, I got by cause my, I think cause my workouts were shorter. I ran a marathon. I ran the LA marathon my senior year, um, in the spring and I had to eat more, but it was still, you know, it was still like grape nuts. You know, it was just like mm. simple carbs, like nothing, um, not fat. I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't doing it properly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I, well, at least, at least you weren't like under eating. Cause that would have had much more serious ramifications. Sure. Right. So yeah. even though the Froyo diet wasn't ideal, you know, oh, at least I, it's, it's, it's I, think I thought I was under eating. I think I was trying to under eat by eating those things, but the amount sure. of the sugary crappy stuff I was eating was keeping me going, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what kind of led then to you, you know, shifting how you view nutrition, starting to incorporate more fat into your diet, realizing that, that what you were doing was not healthy for you or serving you well in any way. So I, in 1998, I, um, got this opportunity as a, as a triathlete and sort of starting to do adventurous stuff. I got an opportunity to be part of an eco challenge team. So like a multi-day adventure race. Um, and that started, a whole new world of having to fuel for longer distance events. Um, and I remember like packing snacks or talking about nutrition with teammates and be like, Oh, I just want pretzels. And it was like, no, you need to have pretzels with peanut butter in them. And that was new for me. Like, Oh really? God. Like I just I started realizing that these people were fueling with more substantial stuff. And I had to yes. um, wrap my head around that for sure. As this triathlete who was still trying to like eat like I was, even though it wasn't, correct you know Mm -hmm. so um I was uh an adventure racer and for a number of years a vegetarian adventure racer because I still wasn't eating meat um and but you know dabbling in dabbling in protein is a ridiculous phrase but that's (laughs) (laughs) like I was uh you know eating fats and proteins um trying to figure that out and then after a chunk of years of doing that as an vegetarian I realized that it wasn't going very well like I was 
I was fatigued. And I remember this kind of moment. It was years into doing that sport where I was like, I, I don't think I can sustain this as a vegetarian because I wasn't very good at supplementing with alternative proteins. I just mm-hmm. was kind of lazy about it. I was like in my 20s going, oh, I get by on this and that and the other. Mm-hmm. Um, so while I was still doing those, and this is maybe to the year 2000 to 2002 or something, I just realized that I had to, I started eating meat again and I felt better and I could go longer and be stronger and um, not feel so fatigued, whether that was during a race or after. Um, mm-hmm. So I did incorporate meat back into my diet. But then once I stopped doing the long stuff, I was kind of like, oh good, now I don't have to eat meat. <laughs> <laughs> I never really liked it. I just never really liked it. And it was even back then, I mean, it wasn't red meat. I was eating like chicken, turkey, Sure. But, um, I just became more aware and then, uh, yeah, and then it became just more balanced and I got better at supplementing the right proteins. And that honestly is something I still sort of struggle with because I just prefer, like my palate prefers, like if I could just get by with very minimal protein, I'd, I'd be happy, but I can't. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I have yeah. to work that constantly. And you just don't like fish? Is that kind uh, of where that was no. coming from? I don't really like fish. I mean, sometimes I like fish. I went out to a nice dinner last week and had a sea bass, like a you know really nicely prepared sea bass, um, and that was enjoyable. But um, I don't crave it. I don't really, mm. you know, I just don't really like it. It's, it's yeah. Not, I wish that I did. And by, yeah, yeah. And by the way, it's so funny that you're an adventure racer, which I like just learned about you. Yeah. Like again, listeners, I swear I'm not like, you know, picking through everyone who's done an eco challenge oh. and having a I know. Because I've heard Travis and Marshall. I know it's like, okay, so they have to be from Colorado and run an eco right. challenge. Yeah. No, I know. Um, That's funny were you ever I'm on their team? or no? Um, I raced with Marshall once or twice, for sure. Once we did a race this is actually another like an interesting nutrition story. We were at a race um, in the British Virgin Islands, like a five day stage race or something. So it was me and Marshall and two other guys. Um, but I have a nutrition thing from that race. Like I got, we spent one night on a yacht, like after a full day of racing and I just went under the deck. They gave me the, whatever the cabin, the one place where you could actually sleep in a bed. And I like got in there, took off my clothes, lay down in the bed. And then we woke up and the sea was super rocky. And I just started barfing all over the place and like swaying back and forth like trying to get to the bathroom and then being slammed against the other wall and then it was just horrendous um but and I had to race that day so like we finally got to a shore and I oh my god I mean I don't know how I even got clothes on it was like a pathetic scene (laughs) um (laughs) just pathetic and I'd been throwing up and then um was laying in the sand and someone handed me a goo, like a packet of goo, like a gel, right? Mm-hmm. And then I just mm-hmm. like took little tiny, I mean, it took me about 20 little bites of one packet of goo just to get the little bit down and a little bit down and a little bit down. But it brought me back to life and I got in a kayak and paddled away. So I am a firm believer <laughs> that those things can actually, you know. Yeah. Race. So anyway, I raced with Marshall once or twice. I don't think I ever raced with Travis. I've been... um Travis's support crew at a race in Europe and made him oh, nice. a, a million sandwiches over <laughs> a number of days. That guy can eat. He's like a walking metabolism. But um, yeah, I've now that yeah. that adventure race world was pretty small and close knit, which was so nice yeah, to just yeah. be like traveling around the world with the same people and like bonding over a certain level of suffering that other people don't, you know, go through. So yeah, it was yeah, just yeah. a nice group, and we're all still. You're like, oh, I know him from Adventure. You know, it's just like a nice little <laughs> family. Some yeah, of them still doing funny. it, but uh, not me. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, the most recent one, I'm, I'm actually, I'm looking forward to whenever it comes out on Amazon yeah. Prime. The, I think it's the GG one, I suppose. The last June. I heard. I know I'm looking forward to it too, because so many people from when I used to race are racing, which I just, I can't wait to watch it. But I didn't yeah. want to do it. There was an opportunity. There was like a media team getting put together, um, and it you know, was on the table. Like, did I want to race again? And I was kind of like, yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, Why I miss, not? well, I miss you want to barf on a yacht again. Well, there's a <laughs> lot of suffering involved, like a lot. And that one, the one when I barfed was like a stage race where you actually got to sleep, but the yeah. expedition link and eco challenge is nonstop. Um, and I really, I do miss the adventure. I miss the camaraderie. I miss how simple it is to just your only goal for the day is to get from A to B. I miss like a lot of that. Um, but 
just being a mom with two kids, I just yeah. didn't feel like I had the bandwidth to put in the necessary training um, and preparation and everything to get there ready to go, I guess, is what it was. Yeah. And I also yeah. just have a different um, perspective on risk now. I just become more of a worrier with what can happen and have witnessed a few things just even after stopping racing I was a journalist covering it and I you know unfortunately was part of a couple tragedies that I then had to write about that happened during races and then so I just I I kind of just didn't want to put myself back in that situation I guess I'm I think it's but, awesome and I can't wait to watch what yeah sure goes through, but um yeah what um a few follow-up questions there what I mean, if you feel comfortable talking about it, which sure. tragedies were that were those? So in uh, what year was it? 2004, there was a race called Primal Quest and it was in the Pacific Northwest. And um, it was a few days in and we'd be I'd been traveling with some teams. I used to because I used to race before I was just covering it. I would hop on sections with teams because I could kind of mm -hmm. hang there a few days in and I was fresh. Right. So I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I'd like hop on for sections and a photographer friend and my and I hopped on with a team we were or two teams the two lead teams that came through and um one of the teams I'd spent like a lot of the previous day with and knew them pretty well and we were hiking up in the mountains um near Bellingham Washington and I kind of stopped they they went up to the peak and I just stopped because I just I don't know something didn't feel right but they started down climbing the other side and one of the athletes while he was down climbing his hand like dislodged a giant boulder and it tumbled down the valley and hit his teammate and no it wasn't his, oh. it hit his the other team but they were both from Australia so um oh. hit him and killed him instantly oh my goodness yeah so that was one and then another race when I was in um Switzerland during the race we were supposed to rappel down into this gorge and jump in this freezing cold water and sort of float down it um with a life jacket on and stuff, but like still just mm -hmm. float down this whitewater river. And this British woman, her foot got stuck on a piece of rebar and she was held under for two. <gasps> oh. And oh. I'm not sure she's, I should check, but she was um, alive, but not well, like basically, yeah, you know, not well. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, stuff has happened, you know, and it's like surprising that like <laughs> the considering the stuff we do in that sport, it's great that not more has happened. I mean, there has been more. Mm. Uh, I keep remembering yeah. there have been more. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's hard. Yeah, and and I mean, and when you think about, I mean, obviously the 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 Eco Challenge Fiji sound like a great adventure and lots mm -hmm. of fun, but it, yeah, as you said, the the risk involved with some of these things, and and I think many people are kind of just okay with that risk and they just can't be themselves fully if they are not doing what they love to do. But okay. I think it's a real struggle and I'm not sure if it's different for moms versus dads or whatever, but yeah, um, I'm not sure either. Yeah, it's hard. I know yeah. some people who do it and they don't, I think part of it for me is like, I lean toward having anxiety, you know, like I have a yeah. worst case scenario brain. And so like, the amount of things that can go wrong has uh, increased in my brain, I guess, as being as I've become a mom. I don't know. I just I think some parents, whether they're dads or moms, can do that sort of stuff. And you're right. They need to do it to feel alive. And there's certain things I need to do to feel alive, too. But the amount of risk has become less and less for me that I'm willing and able to stomach I guess but other people I I mean I'm happy for other parents who can do it without sure. worrying about it I mean I think I worry way too much about a lot of stuff and I wish that yeah. I didn't but I do yeah and then those those yeah. experiences certainly didn't help that <laughs> so yeah yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's incredibly common. I mean, I'm not doing anything like the, any of these sports that I'm worried all the time about yeah. my kids. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, kind of because we're on this topic of family, let's talk oh. about fueling as a family. You have two yeah. growing boys, eight yeah. and 11. Right. Um, and that, of course, has challenges. And you're active as a family, which is amazing. But uh, I know it can be really challenging when you are active as a family, or even if you're not fueling two young boys, it can, yep. can be, you know, very tricky. So why don't you talk to me a little bit about what food looks like in your household now? 
Yeah. So yes, I have two growing boys who eat a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> my husband does the majority of the cooking for like the dinner meals. Um, he cooks probably 80% of those meals and I cook like fancy breakfasts on weekends and uh, I make lunch every day. But the boys, um, we eat fairly healthy. I guess dinners are always a protein, a vegetable and a carb of some sort, like a pasta or a rice or a homemade bread. I like to make bread. Um, yes, you said you're a baker. I, I want to hear all about baker. that. <laughs> yeah. And I uh, have a garden and all this stuff. But the, um, the boys, we try, you know, they're, of course, obsessed with dessert, but I try to make them like homemade cookies that I made, you know, or we do homemade yeah. ice from whole milk. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, punishments are like, no dessert. <laughs> like right now, like, <laughs> like a three day stretch right now of no dessert because um, they were just terrible yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> they're good boys, but they're at these ages where they just like fire each other up and then like wrestle in the library, you know, like things like that. So um, yeah, anyway, yeah. they eat they eat pretty healthy. They um, like our lunches I pack or some sort of sandwich like this morning. It was like ham rolled into a tortilla and apple slices and carrots and something crunchy. I think it was like honey wheat pretzels or something like that. But I mean, we're not a perfect family, but um, snacks are handfuls of nuts or fruit or I mean, that's like after dinner snacks when they still are complaining yeah. about being hungry. I'm like, then go get yourself a handful of nuts or a piece of fruit yeah. that you're having a bowl of cereal after <laughs> dinner. Um, but it's an yeah. ongoing thing, you know, like it's an ongoing no, I, w I don't want to say struggle, but just learning curve with what fuels them. And uh, I don't like having constantly like packaged snacks. Like it, it bothers me that all these like kid snacks are just packaged in individual plastic. So I try to avoid that if I can, but that's not always, mm -hmm. you know, we're not perfect at that. Um, like we've been driving to the mountains uh every weekend the last four weeks uh so it's like in the car anywhere from an hour and a half to three and a half depending on traffic and I always always in the front of the car I have this bag of snacks and it's like dried pineapple or dried mango and I do have bars in there which I'm very aware are individually wrapped um but the big bag of nuts or this or mm -hmm. that fruit and can't always have a water bottle in the car like I have Good. to have a water bottle I can't stand not having water I like freak out about it but um yeah yeah have, always have your water bottle next to you know and they're always asking me for snacks so yeah we're we're fueling those growing creatures I know we're kind of backtracking a second but some of the things I meant to ask that Marsha would like describe about like going days without food and stuff like was that your experience uh, as well like you would just be going uh, days without food I don't know you get to be pretty um I don't know about days without food, but there have been times where you run out of food, like something's taking long, like a section's taking yeah. longer than you thought, or you got lost and you're like out of your packed food and you like just then <laughs> ration like five M&Ms, you know, five peanut M&Ms, like, okay, I'm going to eat one of these. Yeah, and that's what he said. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like something like that where you just <laughs> deal. I mean, that's, that sport was so interesting because it's just like, you just learn to deal and you cannot waste energy on things that go wrong and you just... I don't know. It was a really interesting like microcosm for life, you know, like there's just a lot of lessons that you can learn out of those races. And I guess I don't know what that has to do with running out of food for five days, but you do. You, we got through a lot of um, sketchy situations diet wise and otherwise, I guess. Well, I think I think the lesson is that, you know, you know, being in really tough situations, like you have been through harder situations, right? Mm -hmm. um, whenever you're kind of struggling, um, I mean, just kind of talking day-to-day -day struggles like nothing like catastrophic obviously but yeah. you know thinking to yourself okay this feels really hard and I'm telling this to myself right now because I'm <laughs> certainly in the weeds with my kids right now but um you know this feels really hard but I know I've been through worse and I've gotten through days where I lived off of five of M's for however for sure. you know it's like I feel yep. like it's that kind of thing I'm sure you can tell me more lessons you've learned but yeah um yeah, but, yeah right. I, I, at least that's what I imagine would be the takeaway is yeah. that right yeah for sure yeah, I can always okay. think back like I've suffered more. And then even like my very first race was probably the most suffering ever. And then any race after that, I'm like, well, this isn't going to be as bad. Like I just, it was kind of good to have a terrible one the first time. And then mm -hmm. um, just know that the rest 
wouldn't be as bad. So yeah, I mean, you draw on your negative experiences and gain strength from them. Right. And so, yeah, yeah, yes, we can apply that to to life now. Yeah. Yeah. And what kinds of uh, sports and things do you guys do as a family together? I I imagine snowboarding, anything else you guys like to do? We um, snowboard, my little guy skis, but um, I was a snowboard instructor like 20 years ago in Tahoe. And so when my oldest one wanted to learn how to snowboard, I'm like, I know how to teach you. I like, I remember how to do that. <laughs> um, so nice. that was, that was gratifying. I taught him how to snowboard, but um, we do that. We do some family rock climbing. We do some family hiking. Um, my oldest likes to run. So we run the Boulder Boulder together a few times and some mm-hmm. other races like he's actually super fun to race with like he is the gamer and like likes uh navigate like starting in a busy start you know and then picking our way around crowds and stuff like that so mm-hmm. um he and I will run together in races he doesn't really like to go for runs but he likes to race um and then we you know we do some family camping and hiking we did a big two week national parks road trip two summers ago i guess and did a lot of hiking and kayaking and canoeing. My husband was a rower. And um, so anytime we get around a flat body of water, we'll try to get in a boat of some sort as a family. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, awesome. You know, we do a lot of stuff together. It's fun. That's really great. Yeah. That's, that's like my, my goal. <laughs> do yeah. you, uh, do you, I mean, were they, I guess just you guys role modeling being active people your boys kind of just naturally became active or you were encouraging certain things or kind of what did that look like was, when they were yeah, growing I think up it was more of a natural thing um we used to ride bikes together my husband used to work at the international mountain bicycling association so we got them on bikes pretty young and we'd go to the Belmont bike park down the road and ride in the dirt and do things like that so but we were always doing stuff and so it wasn't like it was more like choosing which thing to do more than we have to go do something, you know, and they, Got it. they, uh, do their sports. Like they both play soccer. My husband, and I coached my younger son's team for three years, I guess. So I'm, I mean, I'm all for ball sports. I, I just, I loved ball sports as a kid. I think it's great to be part of a team. So they both mm. play soccer. We did that. They, we started that pretty early. Um, basketball. Yeah. I mean, anything, I guess. Yeah. I guess it's natural because we're all in this family, just always doing stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I want to hear about your garden. So you're a home gardener. Um, is it just, do you, are you the one who tends to it? Does anyone else get involved and what are you growing? Um, I, (laughs) I grow a lot of stuff. I love having a garden. The kids, I made them a tiny little garden plot of their own. Um, when we sort of redesigned our garden and so I'll let them pick out seeds um every year but they kind of don't do it as much as they did when they were a little younger I don't know why so that garden gets pretty mm. weedy <laughs> and I tend to take they're, they're they're too cool to garden now um, I, think, you know, I don't know if they're too cool or they're just busy doing other things like oh yeah they Got kind it. of when my oldest was quite young like he'd come out to the garden and they both still do they go out there with me a lot and they I let them pick whatever they want um I grow gosh I mean we're very seasonal here. Like we start growing cool weather vegetables in March. So March is very busy with like planting the lettuces and spinach and peas and mm-hmm. onions. And I um, think that's when I get the carrot seeds and that carrots and radishes and um, all those cool season stuff. And then in May, it's all the heartier things like the tomatoes and peppers and mm-hmm. eggplant. And um, I've been growing, I try to try, I try to grow something new every year. Um, and I recently, the last couple of years, discovered beets from the garden. Like I'd never liked beets before, mm. but I decided to grow oh, them. So now good. I love them from the garden. Yeah, they're great. And then I, I'll take the beets and I sort of create this little dish and I keep the greens, like the beet greens are super tender. Yep. Delicious. yep. Um, yeah, no, I love cooking yeah. beet greens. I mean, I get them from the farmer's market because I obviously don't have a garden in New York City. Yeah. Um, although they do have like shared like garden yeah, spaces, days. community gardens, but sure. uh, yeah. 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 Uh, but, but yeah, I just get like the beet. Yeah, you cook the beet greens up. It's really quite yeah, tasty. They're really um, nice. And, and did you just kind of teach yourself how to garden? Or I where did. did you? I, I was trying to think mm-hmm. about where I learned how to do that or when I started. And I think it was when I was living in San Francisco in my mid-20s and had this great backyard. It was a total Melrose Place living situation. Like I had four friends upstairs and then I lived with like <laughs> <laughs> a girlfriend and two guy friends downstairs. But we had this great yard 
And I just started digging in the dirt one day. Maybe it was when I, I was a freelancer then for a number of years also, like between advertising agency job and I was writing like catalog copy for a couple outdoor brands as a freelancer. So I guess I had time to dig dirt. I remember digging the dirt. I remember um, the first <laughs> food I grew was this tiny little zucchini. And I was like so excited about it. And I cut it into four pieces and like made my roommates all eat. <laughs> eat <some laughs> Um, yeah, so I think that started then. And then with moving to Colorado, I didn't do it when I had a rental. But then when we moved to this house, um, it had a big garden in the back. And I'm like, and that was part of the selling point for me was having the garden space. And so we've been in this house, um, I guess, almost 15 years. And I Hmm. sort of taught myself from that point on, I got this great book that was like the Colorado month to month gardener. And I just sort of followed that. And of course, it's trial and error and everything. But yeah, I've, every season now, I just look forward to March and then May and then we eat out of the garden all season. Um, and I really and it really awesome. inspires my cooking. Like that's my favorite time of year to cook dinners is when I'm mm-hmm. pulling stuff out of the garden and sort of creating like a little top chef challenge for myself, right? Like what can I make <laughs> out of this? We got to use this or so let's use this. And I really, I love that kind of cooking. I love it. And then I also yeah, like yeah. I, as a baker, I also like make homemade noodles or fresh bread. So that's like complimentary things to stuff out of the garden. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm busier in the kitchen, I guess, in the summer <laughs> than that's I am. So like, awesome. Yeah. I'd say like my dream other than having my own washer dryer, which is like the dream in the city yeah. life, you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Especially with I two kids, it's like, oh, I yeah. don't do anything wash washer. Yeah. But aside from that is having my own garden. Yeah. Um, so two things to aspire to eventually. Um, in terms of your baking, uh, right. what is your favorite thing to bake? Uh, favorite, any favorite sweet treats? Maybe you can even share a recipe if, if you have oh, one that yeah. you love. I mean, oh, favorite thing is tough. I like to make these lemon cream currant scones. Ooh, that are really easy, yeah. but they're really good. And we have this little lemon tree in our house that um, gives me Meyer lemons every once in a while. So once the mm-hmm. lemons are ready, I'll use the rind from that. And then the leftover lemon, I'll make like homemade lemonade to go with it. Um, mm-hmm. So I like making those. I like making cookies. I kind of always like having homemade cookies in the house. Um, and I do like a oatmeal raisin slash chocolate chip cookie that's pretty good mm-hmm. I have a good cookbook mm-hmm. I, I mean it's not stuff like not family recipes necessarily or I didn't make some of them I make up because I sort of take a recipe and then tweak it um but I also you know with the sweets I love making birthday cakes I just I don't even like cake but I just love making birthday cakes for some reason <laughs> um with like the butter thing yeah it's super uh-huh. fun. um and then breads I like making these homemade dinner rolls that's uh those are our yeast breads and or baguettes and then for mm-hmm. easter i'll do croissants which is like a three-day process mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. and they don't rise perfectly i don't know if it's because i'm not i've not perfected it or also we live at altitude but um that's a fun challenge is the croissants and then i'll yeah. do cinnamon rolls at christmas uh-huh. and pies at thanksgiving so i don't know i somehow along the way become very domestic with my <laughs> Like I'm feeling like so baking. lazy. Yeah, I'm like, I have like, I mean, granted, I have a four month old baby, but, yeah. but yeah, I definitely buy the frozen croissants from Trader Joe's that you pop in the oven. Oh, they actually good. taste pretty good. I, you know, I do a lot of frozen Trader Joe's stuff. It's just not the baking. Like I, I, I don't know. There's, you know, we find we do the things that um, we enjoy, right? And so like I just yeah. I enjoy baking. I enjoy gardening. And the baking, I don't know. It's just it's very calming to me and yeah, satisfying when you follow directions and something comes out of the oven looking good. I think I have a theory that like rule followers enjoy baking. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like it really well, it's is. Like, if you you have to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, like, my, husband is a chef. my husband cooks, so he'll just throw, he doesn't follow recipes, he just seasons this, does that, you know, but he cannot bake because he wants to just do it his own way. And like, you can't like to you a point with that. cooking, you can do that like, yeah. with certain yeah. techniques, but you cannot just wing it or toss in a little extra whatever baking powder you know like you have to follow the rules and so I think just my personality as a rule follower is a good baker I don't know it like (laughs) 
No, it's yeah. true. It's true. And, and, you know, one of the classes we had to take, uh, you know, in my training to become a dietitian, you know, one of our very rudimentary class, because I had to go back as a career changer, I had to go back and basically get my bachelor of science and then do grad school uh, for diet for become a dietitian. But, um, you know, we had to take a food science class and, and yeah. it was food science and a lab that went with it in a kitchen where you're learning just like all kinds of things. But yeah, absolutely. Baking is a science and mm-hmm. You either have to completely understand the rules that go along with that or follow the directions. Exactly. And I definitely have like made the mistake of like, ooh, what if I try to just slightly tweak this and do this? And like it's just disastrous. Right. So yeah, I'm I'm like sometimes a rule follower. I can fall into both camps. I but yeah. I hate recipes. I just Evan, th- like my clients are always like, Can you send me some recipes? And I'm like, I just kind of throw things in a pot. Like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Which is good. I mean, you're right. To have the knowledge of how, like, what works is great, right? And so for you being yeah. able to throw things in a pot because you know what works. But as, with baking, I think for me, I'd have to study it a lot more to just be able to wing it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No. Oh, I cannot wing anything with baking. I, I, I yeah, yeah. I definitely need to I follow some rules. I would love if you want to send me that scone recipe. I'm sure everyone yeah. would love to see that. Uh, if that's one it's that you really wouldn't mind simple. sharing. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. Awesome. Simple is good. Um, okay. So let's get back to sports nutrition before we wrap things up. Yep. So right now, tell me a little bit about what your training looks like and um, where your sports nutrition is at. Cause I know you said you did a marathon, you did all this adventure stuff. Yeah. Um, give me kind of a sense of kind of a little bit in the past and also currently like what kinds of products you use and what your fueling strategy has been, what kind of sports you're doing. Sure. So these days I'm not doing much in the way of long endurance uh days I guess I'm going out for a run with my dog on a trail to under an hour long you know or like I go to CrossFit and it's an hour or I go on the weekends especially in the summer I'll do longer things where I'm packing a running pack with I love those days where I'm just packing a running pack with like chews I'm a big fan of like cliff blocks and uh Mm -hmm. honey honey stinger chews um Mm -hmm. because I used to eat gummy bears as an adventure racer but now yeah. there's these <laughs> shoes that are actually uh, crafted for endurance sports. So I'm sure. a big fan of those sure. on long, slow things. Um, mm-hmm. And then, but for the short stuff, I mean, I I struggle with eating breakfast before a long thing, which works just fine for a mountain run because I can sometimes eat something on the way up to the mountains. Um, but when I wake mm-hmm. up at home and I drink coffee and I put half and half in it and, you know, then I'll go run or do something. I'm generally fine. But when it's like a 10 o'clock run or like a 930 CrossFit class and I don't eat well or I don't manage to get something in besides coffee or a bite of something like a leftover pancake, um, I do struggle with those high intensity workouts. Um mm. But fueling now, uh, since everything's about an hour long, um, it's fairly manageable. Like I just make sure I have something in my stomach if it's later in the day. And then afterward, I'm a big fan of, and also on longer stuff, I use noon. Um, Mm -hmm. I actually, so I have like EDS, it's called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It's a connective tissue disorder that I was just diagnosed like a handful of years ago, but I didn't realize that there's some dietary stuff that helps me feel better with that. Oh. Um, yeah. So noon is, I mean, sodium. So I basically, I need yeah. sodium. It has something to do with my veins, right? I should know more about this, but uh-huh. um, if I am low on sodium and I am working out, I tend to feel dizzy or like getting out of a hot tub, I get dizzy, okay. really dizzy. So sodium yeah. for me is a big uh, recovery tool and also just sustaining a workout. If I'm sure. on a run, I need to have uh-huh. that sodium in a drink or foods, but noon is, um, something I use after a run. It helps me feel mm-hmm. tremendously better. So it's like a big nice. recovery piece for me is a uh, sodium and noon is good because it. it doesn't have any sugar in it. Um, but I'd still yeah. for longer runs, if I'm doing something high intensity, I still like gels, like I'll eat, um, like a salted mm-hmm. caramel goo. I enjoy still, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. and real foods, but you know, with only doing things for about an hour, I don't need to fuel so much during, um, but the longer stuff, I'll pack like chews, gels, a Justin's nut butter. Mm-hmm. And that's like, that'll get me through a few hours of being in the mountains. Yeah. Why, why do you struggle to get breakfast in? Just like digestion wise, like you're, yeah, you have sense guess, of stomach or? Uh, no, I just, I, it's kind of like a 
addiction to coffee, I think is what it comes down to. Like I wake up and I want coffee <laughs> and then the coffee seems to surpass uh-huh. my hunger. And then it's like 930 and I'm like, Got oh, it. now I'm suddenly starving or like 10 or whatever. And then I just, I enjoy coffee so much in the morning and I'm just not hungry when I wake up. And then I think the coffee just um, exacerbates that. And then and I work at home too. So I get kind of like lazy. Yeah. I don't need to eat breakfast right away. Right. So then I'm just like working, mm-hmm. sipping coffee, working, sipping coffee. And then suddenly it's like, 10 and I'll pour some like almond granola into my coffee mug with a little mm-hmm. coffee flavor at the bottom with some whole milk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. I love it. It's like coffee flavored granola at that point. Um, yeah, yeah. So I do eventually eat breakfast and I'm a bit, I love like a good hearty breakfast, but later, not right when I wake up, you know, like uh-huh. I just don't want anything when I wake up. I want coffee. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I hear you. And, and it's a common thing. Um, I guess, you know, depending on what you're doing, like if you are doing like a high intensity workout and you're struggling though, like that's where it can become problematic. Right. Um, Absolutely. but anyways, this, this, yeah, but this call isn't about me giving you advice. So I, I will shut my mouth. Um, <laughs> I need to keep learning. It is definitely something that I can be doing better and I need to continue to figure that out. And sometimes I'll eat like a few chews, you know, on the way to a CrossFit class, but sometimes that's not enough. Like, and I end up feeling like, oh, so it's definitely, I'm still learning for sure. And I could definitely get better. Yeah. I mean, I think all of us, you know, we are, we're all still, still learning or maybe something works, but you know, we want to still explore other options in case they work better. Right. So, um, awesome. So you're not training for any races, it sounds like, or doing anything like that. Um, right. not as of right now, I'm sort of debating if I'm going to make it, um, a dipsy year. Like my favorite race is the 7.4 mile tra- one way trail running race from Mill Valley to Stinson beach, California. And I've done it, I oh, think nice. 10 years over the wow. last 20, but, um, I might try to get back in. I didn't do it last year. So I'd have to like apply and beg my way back in. So it might be that, but I need to sort of ramp back up now. I took a couple the last few weeks have been oh, kind of hard. We Like I had my mom's memorial. So I was like, yeah. you know, leading up to like right after she passed, I was running a lot with my dog and getting out and hard workouts felt great. And then I went into a new stage of like, I don't have the energy to do that right now. I'm just going to walk yeah. the dog for an hour. And so I'm kind of coming off that and feeling like ready to dive back in and, and then figure out what other events I want to do. Like I'm sort of, I'm really interested in those swim run events where mm-hmm. you like ran between islands and then trail run across it like combines like my two favorite oh, cool. my, yeah like open water swimming and trail running like sounds great awesome. but I don't have any where would that be there. um they're kind of all over the place they're all over the world but they're huh. also now all over the country and so I don't know there's one in the Pacific Northwest that looks cool but it would be cold <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, the water would be cold but I yeah I'm sort of trying to figure out what I want to do like I'm interested in Spartan yeah. racing I think but I'm not sure and I like just being healthy enough to run um big days in the mountains but um yeah I'm not specifically training for anything right now I kind of just say that I'm always training to be healthy enough to do what I feel like that day totally no I I can relate to that right now because I'm in this weird stretch right now where I mean like literally today at four months postpartum I ran for the second time and like you know mm-hmm. 30 seconds on one minute of walking I mean it's ridiculous yeah um, but, that's okay, uh, but but I haven't run a marathon in three and a half years which is crazy yeah. I haven't done I mean I did a half marathon when I was pregnant or whatever but mm-hmm. um I haven't done anything long I haven't I've done trail here and there but but like yeah. I think about what I want to train for and at this point in this season of my life it's like kind of not high priority to do races but rather sure. like I just really want to run in the mountains for like yeah, a couple hours totally. like I want to yep. train like that's my goal right now I know I'm in California in June mm-hmm. and it's like and I'll be in Hawaii and California and like all I want to do is be able to run for like one or two hours like on the beach and the mountains, like, you know, so it's, yeah, it's being able to do what you want to do. And sometimes I think it's easy sometimes to fall into that comparison trap and see, Oh, wow. This mom like jumped back and is doing this race and Uh whatever. And I've just kind of like over it. I'm just like, you know what? Uh, And especially as a sports dietitian and I'm interviewing all these amazing athletes, it's like, it's easy to feel a little bit of imposter syndrome. So I'm like, wow, I have not done anything, Mm -hmm. but you know, it's, whatever we're all kind of doing our we're own thing on and, and I, for sure. yeah exactly and I think um you know it's important to kind of do what what you enjoy and what feels right and yeah. um that's like also the key to not getting burnt out for sure um yeah. 
which I guess I kind of leads me to one of my last questions. Um, many of my listeners are, of course, runners, or maybe not. I don't know. I, I don't really know my whole. I'm, this is so new. This whole podcast thing. I'm still learning who my listeners are, but I think many of them are runners or at least athletes. Mm-hmm. And um, going back to your book, um, which again, really enjoyed and it's so much fun. Um, you know, many people aren't running fans, and kind of can you give maybe a few top tips of how people who may want to start running um, for health or for fun mm-hmm. or whatever, uh, but they don't really know where to start or they're intimidated or they think it's too much pain or whatever it is like, sure. yeah, maybe give them a, an overview of your book um, and yep. they can of course learn more by buying it. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I think people, <laughs> it's a few different things. I think people like we were talking about are hard on themselves and think that a lot of people say, I'm not a runner, this can't run, you know, like, and they point to their bodies and stuff, but like everybody can run. And the goal for everybody does not have to be a marathon. It doesn't have to be a half marathon. It doesn't have to be a 5k. Like if you want to run, if something in you wants to run, you can, and there are different ways to approach that, that not everybody does. I think a lot of people look up like a training plan online and it's like prescribed certain things on certain days, but that's, maybe isn't going to be sustainable for someone who doesn't like to follow a training plan. So like the whole purpose of my book is to help people find running in a way that works for them and to create a healthy relationship with running so that they're going to crave it and want to do it for the rest of their lives. And what that looks like is knowing yourself well enough to ask yourself questions or at least answer the questions of what is going to set them up for success? Like, are you a morning person? And if you're not, don't force yourself to go running in the morning because you're going to hate it. Like, mm. figure out there are other times of the day that people can run and you don't have to, yeah. like, everybody doesn't have to get up at five and run before seven, you know? Like, there are different ways to do it. And then, like, do you, are you someone who needs alone time or are you a complete extrovert and is only going to be motivated by running with a friend or finding a group? Like, there's no right answer there, you know? Like, ask yeah. yourself that question. And then are you someone who like craves nature? Like, do you, are you a mountain biker or, or do you just enjoy being outside? Are you a gardener? You know? And if you are someone mm-hmm. who really like thrives off natural environments, then like try trail running. And that doesn't mean yeah. like running up a mountain or doing an ultra. That means like finding a nice patch of dirt running next to a Creek. And like, that can be super enjoyable and you can like mm-hmm. learn to love running that way. I just think there's different there's different entry points. And then also like, are you a tech driven person? Like I am not, I don't even run with a watch, but like some people Mm -hmm. have to have their tracking device on because they want to know what, what speed they're running and how far they've gone. And that's totally fine. Like some people might want headphones, some people might not, but I think it's asking yourself questions about your individuality and then applying those to your entry point into running and then know that it's okay to walk. Like you're saying like you're barely, you're run walking right now. And I think that people Mm -hmm. think they're a failure if they're doing that and they are not, you know, there's like methods proven to getting into running that way. And I think it's perfectly fine and people should just accept where they're at and start from there and go out in an environment that they enjoy and company they enjoy wearing something they enjoy, you know, and just really Mm -hmm. make it about the enjoyment as opposed to, maybe a hard, fast goal, or I don't know, something where they think yeah. it's supposed to be, you know, running doesn't have to yeah. be any certain thing. It just, the goal is to like really enjoy it so that you keep doing it. So that's yeah, absolutely. Of the book. Yeah. Oh, I love, no, I love all of that. And, and certainly like what I always preach to the people I work with is, you mm-hmm. know, especially people who aren't exercising at all, is just finding a form of movement that you enjoy and that, yeah. cause you're not going to sustain it just like with food, you know, you know, finding a food that, you know, you enjoy that satisfies you. It's not all about, you know, a physical fullness, but also like what actually tastes good, what's appealing, yeah. what's satisfying, you know, um, if you're just forcing yourself to like eat things you hate all the time, like that's right. just not a way to live. Um, no. And even if you have this quote unquote discipline to do that, it right. just sounds miserable. Why would you spend your life doing that? <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah. so yeah, absolutely. It's focusing on the way a movement makes you feel not how many calories you're burning or how many pounds you're losing, but like, how does movement make you feel? And yeah, knowing yourself and, and, um, customizing it to that. So I I really like that whole approach. And I think that's an approach that you can apply to many different things, not just with, with running with sport. Um, so yeah, awesome. And, and it's funny the whole walking thing. Cause I remember 
um, in my first pregnancy, I ran towards almost toward the end. And I was like walking at the end. I was just like, oh, this is an exercise. But then I was like, actually, it is. This is really yeah. hard, like when I'm really pregnant. And yeah. then the my second pregnancy, I stopped running like halfway through or something. And, um, and I was doing all kinds of other stuff and it was fine, but like walking absolutely can be hard, uh-huh. especially if you're hiking, but any kind of walking. Yeah. And, and it's funny. Cause like, and again, you don't have to define yourself as any one thing. It's like, yes, I've run marathons. I've run yeah. a 50, I've run 50 mile, I've run 50 K. And I've also today did 30 seconds of running and one minute walking for 20 yeah. minutes. And that felt sure. hard, <laughs> yeah. you know? So it's like, yeah, it, it's, 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 because- it's like, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, I mean, go ahead. I think as runners, we have like a certain identity crisis when we're not running like we used to yeah. or have been. And so when you're walking, you just start feeling bad about yourself. But like, it just depends on where you're at, right? Like you're coming off of having a child, which is like a major event to your body. Yeah. And so, and then people who start off running, like it's actually, it's pretty, it makes perfect sense that if you run a little bit and then walk, you give yourself time to recover from that little run and then yeah. walk run again. And then it's like a really good, safe, sustainable way to build back either back into something or into something. Right. I mean, and there's no shame in it. That's the thing. There's just no exactly. shame. <laughs> and yeah, and there's also no you shame have to in start where you're at. Exactly. And like running any pace is also perfectly fine. I just, yeah. It's tough because I think running, you know, we see runners around that are super fit and professional and uh, there's just, but it doesn't have to look like that. It's like running looks like whatever running looks like when you're doing it, you know? Yeah. And you also don't have to have a certain body type to run. I think that's also a very common misconception that, oh, I have to be super thin and whatever. It's like, no, there are every body size and shape you can imagine you can run, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's obviously what's comfortable for you. um, But, you know, especially like, like even on the ultra scene, you see like all kinds of body shapes out there. So, and I've talked about this before in my podcast, like people are like, oh, well, for performance, I have to lose all this weight, blah, blah. And, um, you know, it's question that and, and, but yeah, so, so I definitely encourage anyone who's thinking about running and do, you don't think you like it to check out your book, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> Lisa's book is awesome. Um, and with that, let's wrap up with my quick bites questions, um, before this drags on too long. So I know we both have to hop off at some point. Um, so, okay, let's go. Favorite meal or snack when in a hurry? Uh, my little mug full of granola. That does sound delicious. <laughs> Uh, do you make your granola, by the way, or is it no, a store No, I need to learn how to do that. I do make a lot of things, but um, it's, it's super currently easy. Currently, it's a store-bought, um, it's Trader Joe's almond butter granola. <gasps> it's really I good. I had that this morning. I oh, literally have two bags in my pantry. It is so yeah, delicious. It is good. Try my toddler is going bowl through. Bowl of coffee. Yeah, a bowl of coffee. <laughs> I will. Oh my God, I'm totally trying that. No, I had it with yogurt and berries and banana this morning, but my toddler's going through like a granola obsession phase and we're just like, you're eating something awesome. Great here. Um, So nice. Uh, Favorite meal or snack when not in a hurry? Um, An avocado in half with salt and hot sauce and then dipping some like blue chips into it. Yum. That yeah. sounds delicious. It is. Delicious. Uh, favorite post-race or post-rate training effort meal or snack? Mm. So the bad one that I shouldn't admit to a nutritionist is like fries <laughs> and a Coke. <laughs> like I yeah, crave salt bad. and I love yeah. Coke. Like, Coke for any, after anything hard or what I, I don't know, even like after giving birth to my first son, I just really wanted a mm. Coke, but, um, <laughs> but you know, to make that a better thing, I'll throw a veggie burger in there or a good burrito. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But, Salt okay. and soda. I don't know. Salt and Coke. <laughs> yeah. Hey, no, I mean, <laughs> like, just because I'm a nutritionist doesn't mean I don't enjoy all foods. Yeah. I mean, mine's fries and burger for sure. So, okay. you know. Yeah. Uh, okay. Biggest cooking catastrophe or baking catastrophe? Yeah. So I made a flourless chocolate tort once for a New Year's Eve party, but I also forgot the sugar. So it was a flourless mm. sugar <laughs> giant puck <laughs> of chocolate. It was terrible. Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> that became yeah, adjust. that doesn't sound so good. <laughs> no. No. Um, most bizarre or exotic food that you've ever tried? Um, I did try, even though I was a very picky eater when I was a kid. I tried escargot when I was like eight or nine years old, but not eating like meat. Uh, I don't think I liked it. I maybe didn't mind. The, I maybe liked the saltiness of it, but um, mm-hmm. I remember like a snotty yeah. <laughs> texture. And so now as an adult, not eating much meat, I don't dive into exotic foods all that much. So 
I never tried escargot. I've been to France like a bunch of times and, and yeah, that just, I don't know. And it's like, I don't know if you drink kombucha ever, but you know, like that little snot thing in kombucha. Oh, God. Yeah, no, but I you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, I can I like, sort of picture it all. It sounds terrible. Oh, it's so gross. It's so gross. Yeah, I love kombucha, like, but that little texture snotty texture thing is so gross. Yeah, yeah no, it's, <laughs> it's gross. How do you like your eggs cooked? Um, Sort of an omelet, but a very well-done omelet. Like, I don't like a gooey center, so I'll just, like, cook it all the way through, sort of, and flip it over entirely. Got it. Yeah. Uh, If you drink wine, beer, or liquor, or all of them? Um, wine and beer, sort of regularly and liquor very <laughs> frequently but um yeah I'm not opposed to any of that but I don't liquor I'm not super into liquor yeah. I used to like a good Bloody Mary when in like in my 20s if we go out mm. at night and I was like kind of hungry I'd be like oh it's like soup and a drink all in one <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, but, yeah. Uh, cool yeah. <laughs> um what foods remind you of growing up aside from the squid in a bag yeah well I like a, <laughs> I mean <laughs> I still like a good pot of rice with like now with tofu and vegetables is very comforting to me. Um, I just enjoy that. It's kind of comfort food, I guess. And then also growing up in Southern California, having like good, cheap Mexican food reminds me of home, reminds yes. me of Southern California, I guess. Yeah. That's what I'm so much about California is really good Mexican. Uh-huh. Although we can kind of get it in New York, but it's not the same. It's I don't not know. the same. It's not the same. Southern California, yeah. or I guess California Mexican food is different. It's, I mean, it's not true Mexican food, right? But it just has its certain yeah. flavors yeah. that I yeah. crave and I get every time I go home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Same. Uh, what's your favorite ice cream flavor if you eat ice cream? I eat ice cream. I love ice cream. Um, I don't eat it as much as I used that's to. That's right. But you make it. I, I do. Make it. Yeah. So anything, I mean, we do like a homemade vanilla. That's a really simple recipe um, with like whole milk and cre- real cream, you know, and it's delicious. Mm-hmm. But um, otherwise, like going out to ice cream, I like anything with chunks in it, like a stracciatella gelato or yeah. like a coffee with mm-hmm. chocolate chunks. Like I like chocolate chunks of things. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Um, and last but not least, top three items of gear that are most essential to your active lifestyle. Uh uh I mean I guess there's so much gear god okay so I like (laughs) running shoes I guess are imperative and I like review shoes for outside so I am always in different running shoes um Mm -hmm. I think good sunglasses with like polarized lenses that I can wear running doing all the sports that I do but also can wear casually are pretty mm-hmm. key for me. And right now that's a pair of Zeals. Um, I also have a pair of Canons. And then I like this Nathan Sports hipster belt is just like a piece of fabric with pockets. And I slip that on for every run to carry my phone or like a gel or a bag of shoes or my car keys. It's like this super mm-hmm. simple thing, but I cannot live without it. Awesome. Yeah. I thought you were gonna say your snowboard, but oh, I guess yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. I could go into hard goods, but that would be like my snowboard, my skate skis, my, you know, <laughs> all, all the stuff, like my goggles, my kayak, yeah. just too much, too many things. I guess it depends <laughs> on the season, right? It depends on the season. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's awesome. Gear. Thank God for gear. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Lisa. It was such a pleasure chatting with you and learning more about you. Um, where can everyone find you to learn more about you and your books and follow you on social media and such? Um, well, on Instagram, I'm Lisa Jung writes, which is a name I made up like at a press event and regretted it, but now that's my name (laughs) (laughs) on Twitter, which I'm really, um, infrequently on Twitter. I'm just my name. And then I'm on Facebook, but I'm also, I have a website. It's just my name, Lisa, J H U N G.com. And I need to get better about updating, um, things I write there, but yeah, I'm kind of, uh, I just need to generally get better at promoting myself and being more active in that world but you know kids and work and running and all that stuff Dude, but yeah I'm around I hear you. <laughs> yeah like awesome, lots of things awesome. on the to-do list yeah yeah well here this podcast is a start we're gonna put it out into the world yeah. and and I'm sure my listeners will enjoy it so thank you for your time Lisa and thank hope you, so you much, have Brad. a great time uh with your family and all the adventures that you're doing thank you and you as well that wraps up today's episode with Lisa. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly had a fun conversation with her today. As she mentioned, you guys can check her out on social media and Instagram. She's Lisa Jung writes on Twitter. She's Lisa Jung and her website is www.lisajung.com. 
you should definitely check out her book, Running That Doesn't Suck. I will, of course, link to it in the show notes, as well as she has another book on trail running, which I haven't read myself, but it sounds really fun. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Um, I have a lot of you know fun guests coming your way, so keep on listening, and thanks for your support. Have a great day, guys. <laughs>